everybody. Hey, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Hey, y'all. Welcome back. All right. We're here. Day 60. You guys, here's the thing. 30 days in. We've been doing this for 30 days. Can you believe it? It doesn't seem like that to me. I know sometimes I could do something and it seems like it's all the time. Hasn't felt like that. Just felt like this is what I was supposed to be doing the whole time. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you for joining me. Those of you who have been with me every night, you already know we about to jump in. Um, we're discussing my book, The 90 Day No Talk Experiment. I wrote this book after meet. I met a fellow, a gentleman, and, uh, you know, we enjoyed each other's conversation. Great conversationalist when you could get him on the phone or when he had time. And uh, I found myself very frustrated in in. I don't do frustrating situations. It's just not how my life works anymore. And so either you're going to be consistent with me or you're not. Whatever consistency there is. If you're consistently going to be absent, be absent. If you're going to consistently be here, be here. But if you tell me something, I expect you to follow through on your word. And he would say, I'll call you, I'll call you right back. Right back might be seven days from now. I don't understand how that timing works in your mind. So I got to a point where I was just extremely frustrated. I'm like, wait a minute. Now, hold on. What is going on? And I told God, I said, I don't do frustration. Not real sure. Uh, what is going on here? And the Lord said, don't talk to him for 90 days. And I was like, oh, OK. So I told him, I said, you know, God told me not to talk to you for 90 days. He's like, I don't agree with that. Doesn't really matter what you agree with. That's just what God told me. And since we ain't nothing to each other, listen, it's all good. And um, I thought, you know, on the 91st day, we would jump right back in and uh, pick up where we left off. So I spent 90 days writing every day how I felt not talking to him. And about the 12th day in, the Lord said, you're writing this for one person and I want you to write it for a lot of people. And so I shifted about se day 78 because we're going down and started making this about people, not just about him. Because, you know, on day 91, he didn't call. On day 191, he didn't call. And you, you, find out, you know, he's living life and, and so am I. And so that's how this book got birthed. Just, just in case it was always in there, I'm sure. But, uh, this is kind of my journey through, uh, finding, you know, I, I, I wrote on the book. I thought, um, I wanted to be in the arms of my love, but found myself running straight into the arms of the one who loved me. So here I was, you know, looking for love. And I don't even want to say in all the wrong places, they're just some people that are equipped to handle you. And I don't mean handle you as in he got to, you know, handle me. But what I'm trying to give can be too much for some people. And you have to accept where people are. You know, you may he may not be able to receive the magnitude of this gift. Some people get little gifts. Some people get big gifts. Right. And you give people according to what they can handle. And maybe it was just more than what. I, I might have never been in God's plan. I'm almost positive I was not in God's plan because here I am uh, two years later, still single, uh, but living my best life, best life I've ever lived. And, and that was the thing, too. I just turned 45 and I was living really good. Me and God were just so in tune with each other. And ain't it just like the devil to use something that you've been praying for and asking God for to present to you in your face? Um very single, according to what I believe and understand, but very handsome. And so sometimes when you get with those types of people, um, everybody thinks they're handsome and everybody thinks they're, you know, he's their man. Listen, I'm a soldier on, on the battlefield in the army of the Lord, but I'm not trying to fight nobody that think you her man. And she don't even know if you are or not. So listen, do you boo and I'm gonna do me. So anywho, this is just kind of a journey through my ups, downs, how God has brought me through, how God has brought me out. And I did buy another book. I mean, write another book. It's called Wisdom from a Deep Well. Wisdom from a Deep Well. And this is just little wisdom nuggets, things that, you know, things that um, God will share with me that I think were, you know, good to share. So one little wisdom nugget, reliving your past is like trying to pay the bill over and over when Jesus already picked up the tab and paid the tip. So stop it. Stop doing that. Every day we go back it over and over and over and over. No, we rehearse it. And what should I have done? And I could have did this different. Now I share my past, my stories, because that's how you can relate to what I'm saying. Sometimes people are very visual and we can see I'm a storyteller. 
I tell my students quite often, storytellers make between, what is it, thirty-six and $126,000 a year, depending on how good of a storyteller they are. So I'm always trying to make that $126,000 a year um, by telling good stories. Hey, Kim. Ooh. All right. So tonight we're on day 60. We're a third of the way in. You only have two thirds more to go. Day 60 is called my glass tabletop desk. Now, if you've been following me on YouTube, of course, you've seen my tabletop desk and probably Instagram. I've shared some posts uh, doing stuff, working at the desk. I don't have that desk in here anymore. It was too large for the space. It was overwhelming. That's what I mean when I say people are too large for other people. Sometimes we can overwhelm them with our presence and who we are. And I'm a large presence. I'm going into a room. This is just the truth. I have to say this because it is the truth. Any room I go into, I'm going to turn heads. I don't know why that is. It's just something that happens. Normally, I wear lots of loud earrings or I wear lots of bangles. I love a good accessory. So I'm always going to go into a room and turn heads. And some people can't handle the magnitude of that, that overwhelming presence because that is who I am. But it has zero to do with me. I believe it is who is inside of me. It is the Lord who come, who goes before me. Before I even show up in the room, God has already shown up and he has made a way for me. And so that's how I enter a space. And some people just can't handle that. It is all well in Jesus name. All right. Hey, y'all. Let's pray I make it through this without too many yawns. I'm a, I'm a, I might need to get some therapy on how to fix that. Um, day, uh, I'm on page 79. If anybody's following the book, this is day 60, my glass tabletop. It's summertime here. Of course, when I wrote the book, it was summertime at the point, at that point. While I'm off from my regular job, I still have work to do for my side business and my social platforms. So my kids and I have about seven form, seven streams of income. I prayed and asked God for seven streams of income. Now, sometimes it trickles in, sometimes it flows in. It's just randomized, not randomized, but it's different income sources that the Lord uh, adds to us to help take care of the bottom line and then some over things that God wants us to do. Um, I ask God one specific thing about money. I never ask God to make me rich. I ask God, give me seed so that I could sow into the kingdom and his kingdom work. And it would seem that he has always blessed that whatever I've asked, God has always provided so that I would be able to then give out to the kingdom work. When I give it to kingdom work, I don't worry about what happens with it. I don't worry about what they do with it. I don't ask for an itemized receipt of everything they spent the money on. It's not my business. They're going to have to meet the Lord and decide Did they do what he said. I'm going to have to meet with the Lord and decide, did I give what he told me to give? And that's how I live my life with finances and giving. Um. But with that being said, I work social media so that I can gain income and then writing the book. That's a stream. And then, you know, different other things. Um, OK. With that being said, I like to start my day in a clean space. I, if you follow my cleaning videos on any platform that you're watching on, you see me clean my house. Sometimes I do a 15 minute quick clean, but my house is already clean before we go to bed. So I'm not going to bed with a dirty house and waking up to a dirty house because I can't function in that. So I have to make sure that things are in place before I can actually sit down and start my day. If my space is not clean, then I have to take time to clean it before I can sit and work. My brain will not allow me to just let it be. People are like, oh, just work around the mess. I can't work around the mess. It doesn't happen for me that way. To me, it seems to give a fresh start and a new perspective to a new day. That's how I approach my life. Let me see. What's my fresh start? What's my new perspective? You know, people will say things like, um, um, this is what happened or they're in this, this dump, this, this, this down place. And I'm like, well, you know, there's always tomorrow. We, we can, we can start over tomorrow. You know, let's, let's just plan for the next day. Don't worry. Next time you'll know exactly how to handle that situation because I'm always looking at it from that perspective. I don't have a Debbie Downer mentality. There are moments. I think I had a little bit of a moment earlier. I was watching something and there was a love scene between a husband and wife. And I think the wife was dying or something. She was she was diagnosed with something and she was not going to live long. And I just I got emotional about that. It is what it is. It's just a human thing. It's a girl thing. You know, if I still cycled, I'm sure that's what it was. It would it would I probably am cycling or something. I don't know. 
Um, but I don't have bad days. I don't have bad moments. People are like, well, how's your day? I have good days every day. I purpose it in my heart to do because God is so good to me. Why would I have a bad day? Even when things don't go my way, he's still good. He's still gracious. I still woke up this morning. I still have the activity of my limbs, even though my hips was hurting. I still have the activity of my limbs. I still can speak for myself. I can make sound decisions. I don't have bad days. Every day's a good day to be alive. Last night, so again, two years ago, last night, my 13-year-old uh, sat in my bedroom with me and had dinner. I know who eats in their bedroom. I was working. And he wanted to share space because we were finishing up an audio book. We were listening to a book together. And so he came into where I was in here and uh, just decided to eat with me because I was working. I think he was eating. I was working, but it was fine. Uh, he has a tendency, though, to spill his food. So when eating in my bedroom, he has to sit at the desk, which is a glass top. Because I, I'd prefer him to spill on the glass top than on the carpet because we had carpet back then or, you know, spill on the bed or I have a little table stand, but I probably was using it working with the computer. So he has to sit at the glass top. It never fails. Never, ever fails. This is my son. He's my messy child. I have my oldest and my youngest are my messy children. I'm praying for him in Jesus name. He always spills. That puts a kink in my plans when trying to get started. In my work the next time I sit in that space. Today was no different. He spilled. Knowing this, I headed to the cleaning bag to get my supplies to clean off the glass top. I sprayed down uh, the desk and proceeded to wipe it down because I had work to do. And that's when this hit me. The glass tabletop is just like me. It's dirty. There's stains and spills and fingerprints and smudges. And even when I think it's clean, I cleaned the mirror today using some glass cleaner, some paper towel. Looked clean. I was getting out of the shower, getting myself together because I had to go pick up sister from work. And I'd been working in the garden and stuff all day. And um, I looked at the mirror from where I was standing on the other side and I could see all the streaks. And I was like, oh, man, that was so clean when I cleaned it this morning. How to get dirty? Well, it evidently wasn't all the way clean. There was some streaks left. So what do I have to do? I got to spray it again. And I got to wipe it off again just until I get all the the, 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 um, the sm smudges off. It had fingerprints all over it, stains from failing to wash it on previous days. There were even some dried on crusty bits and I had to apply some elbow grease to remove it. I mean, really, because he is a messy eater. He's a messy cook. He loves to cook. He'll cook fresh bread. He'll cook focaccia. He'll do an artisan bread, quick rolls. He'll do anything. He'll bake a cake when he comes home from school. But most of the stuff is still on the counter. Now, he'll do, do a rudimentary clean, but I have mom eyes. And I'm looking and I'm like, why, is, why does nobody see what's on this, this counter? Why? And I run my hand across the counter like, I feel bumps and stuff. There's stuff here. Even if you can't see it, I know it's there. But God reassured me that no matter what is on me, my past, my mistakes, um, my misdecisions, my missteps, my personality conflicts with people, my uh, family situation, work stuff, no matter what is on me, what has attached itself to me and even stuff I feel like has to have elbow grease applied to get it off of me. All can be gotten off when the right product is applied. There's nothing about me or you that we've gone through. There's no stain. There's no blight. There's no uh, stain against your record. Here's me, five years old, the very first time a man ever touched me. From five to 13, I have those many years of there being something that happened to me in my life. And no matter what it is, it still can be gotten off if the right thing is applied. He All he has to do is apply the right thing. But a lot of times we count ourselves out. We never think that we're worthy. We always think that there's a stain that people can see. Um, somebody just commented on one of my videos. I think it was a video from a couple of days ago. He said, I like how you dance like uh, nobody's watching because I don't care if you're watching. I mean, I care about people, but this is my life and my story and I get to tell it and I get to show 
uh, the best foot forward. I get to the life I live now is all because of what Jesus did then. He did it on the cross 2000 plus years ago. He did it in me 1990 or 1990. Then again, in 1999, when I made a permanent decision for the Lord and he keeps doing it for me every day, because there are days when I don't have um, when I am, I'm, I'm I might say something I, I shouldn't say or I think something I shouldn't think or go to a place maybe I shouldn't go. I don't go many places, but, you know, in my mind, maybe or something like that. When I feel like I'm so dirty, when I feel like there's just when that past thing wants to try to rear its ugly head and God's like, no, 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 you're good. You're fine. I'm going to clean you. You can't clean you. There is not enough washing. You hear victims who have been uh, who have had things happen to them. And they say, I just wanted to take a shower and I just wanted to wash myself over and over and over. And no matter how hard I scrub myself, I just can't get clean. That's how we are. No matter how hard we scrub ourselves from our past, we can't get clean. No matter if you slept with one or a hundred, you can't get clean from any of that. It has to take the person who knows the right thing to apply to get all of the scrapes off. It takes the person who can put a little elbow grease in. And I think this is what I really think. There's no effort in God cleaning us up. At least not to him. He doesn't feel like you're a job or you are too much or you got too much going on that he is just taking all this time to clean. I can clean my house for hours and hours and hours and still see dirt. One cleansing from Jesus and that's all it takes. Um, Psalms 51, one through two, Psalms 51 is one of my favorite, um, favorite uh, verses where David is praying. He said, uh, created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Psalms, I think that's 51, 10, 51, one and two says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to your tender uh, mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. We think sin separates. All we have to do is repent. Ask God to, you know, ask God to forgive me for whatever it was. <laughs> you don't even have to remember all of it. Just do it on inclusive. Lord, forgive me from all the things I've ever done wrong to you, against you, in spite of you. And immediately there is a washing. There's a renewal. There's a renewing. And he doesn't remember it anymore. All we have to do is ask him. But we think that we're such a hard job for God. There is nothing too hard for God. What is too, who the most hardened criminal is not too hard for God. If you haven't uh, uh, committed a crime in your life, then surely you're not too hard for God. Isaiah 118, come now, right now, come, you, come, 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 come. When I want my children, I'll say, come. And they're old, they're grown, but they're still my children. This is how God wants to deal with us. Come, come now, right now, in this moment, in this very moment, in this space of time, in this 60 seconds, in these milliseconds, come right now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Me and you, let us talk about it. Let's, let's chat together. Let's sit with one another. Let's fellowship. God, I'm so dirty. I can't even be in your presence. He, he told Moses, listen, you can't even look at me because you can't handle the presence of God. Just turn around, uh, uh, put yourself in the cleft of this rock, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just let you see my back. See, that was the old covenant. Now we have the new covenant. We don't have to be worried about dying in the presence of God. We just go into the present boldly. Boldly. I'm going in. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to get my one. I don't get one night with the king. I want all my nights. I'm going in and I'm going to say what I got to say. It's not like he don't already know. He is all knowing. Ah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. I was thinking about this yesterday. Uh, because it was Holy Week and yesterday was Resurrection Sunday. And I was thinking, we were singing about the blood and I was thinking about the blood. And here's what I thought. How can the blood, because it is red, we've, we've all seen red blood. How can red blood wash you white as snow? We would think that the white would be contaminated with the red blood. But there are no contaminants in Jesus. And everything that he is washed in his blood is made clean. It's like that's the 
Holy Ghost detergent, right? I'm, I've done a couple loads of laundry today and I'm always looking to see if there's anything, any spots that I miss anything, are there any smells? You are fresh, new, clean, all the things. He says, come, let's reason together. Why can't we just talk about it? You tell me the things and I'll forgive you for the things if it makes you feel better. Because that's what he wants to do. And we, again, we, we want to stand back from God because we feel like something we did can hurt him. What can we do? To hurt him. Nothing. First John 1 7. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is the blood that cleanses us from all sin. That's all we have to do. If we allow the Lord to spray us with his grace. Listen, listen at this. Listen at how God wants to say this to us. If we allow the Lord to spray us with his grace, with his mercy, with his love, just like glass cleaner on top of a glass top desk, we can become clean and ready for use. We'll tell people, no, I'm not. I'm not. You know, God couldn't use me. God couldn't. Pick, how could he pick me? No, we just let God clean us up. We let him do the cleaning. Remember, I told y'all one of my favorite Joyce Myers, uh, teachings where she shared she started teaching bible study on her porch in the trailer park in hot pants smoking a cigarette what and she's one of the most premier voices and has been for years and years and years and years and we looking at our little stuff talking about god can't use me use me jesus use whatever i got whatever story i have whatever hurt that i have from my past whatever situation i'm going through right now use it lord use it so that somebody else so somebody else could could benefit from it. Whatever I got is open to use. I hold nothing back from God. I remember telling the Lord, I didn't want to go to a foreign land for missions. I wanted to stay right here on, on, on good old American soil. He was like, really? And I had to reconcile that. God, wherever you send me, I'll go. Wherever you send me, I'll go. Good, because I'm going to make provision for you wherever I send you. So don't worry about going to some place. Don't worry about not being qualified. Don't worry about what you went through before, because somebody's going to need to hear that story. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. You got to have gone through something to have a testimony. It's testimony service. Every time I go to my dad's church, they have testimony service. There should be something that you can tell people about that God has done for you, that has got you out of a place that you could not get yourself out of. Let me tell you something. 18 years of a loveless marriage, I couldn't get myself out because I had agreed to stay married till death do me part. But I'm telling you, it wasn't God who got me out of it. It was somebody else who made a decision and God was like, okay, you free now. I, I could go. Or stay. You pick your choice. And it was so freeing to know. It is so free. Not was. Because this is a now thing for me. It's so freeing to know that nothing that I do is going to ever separate me from God's love. Nothing. I don't care what it is. Think of the worst thing I could ever, ever, ever do. And God's still going to forgive me if I ask for forgiveness. When I ask for forgiveness. Now that doesn't give us the, the, he don't give us just carte blanche to do whatever. Grace is not your free get out of sin ticket, right? His grace is there. And because it is there, then I don't want to do things that causes disfellowship, disunity, disharmony between me and him. I like it here. I like how I feel when we're together. I like how I feel when, when we're one with another. I like how that feels. I like how it feels when me and Jesus are doing so good. It makes me and other people get along. I like that. I, I like it here. And because I like it here, then I don't want to do things that are going to cause uh, disfellowship, disunity. I want to live a life on purpose that is pleasing to the Lord. And because that is the way it is, then I choose, I make the choice consciously not to do things that I know would cause that disfellowship. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. I miss it quite often. However, I'm, I'm right in my intention to live a life pleasing to God. While we believe it is elbow grease that removes the stain, it is truly it truly is what is applied to the stain that makes the actual scrubbing go easier and removes the stain. Y'all know we have a stain remover, right? You get a little grease spot or something. You know how to get it out. Take a little bit of this and a little bit for, for uh, red wine. Use this for um, coffee. Use this for 
um, grease stains, use it. There is a remedy to get out any stain there is. And for everything, every stain on your life, in your life, the remedy is Jesus. His blood shed on the cross for us. That's the remedy. We don't have to have two, three of these and four of those and put it on ice and freeze it in the freezer for three days and scrub it with a little bit of this and get your two. We don't have to have any of that. We just need the blood. The blood is enough. It's enough to cover and it's enough to cleanse. I might have to preach that. It's enough to cover and to cleanse the blood. I'm going to preach that. Praise God. Does God do all the work? Sure. He did. He already did it. He already did the work on the cross to clean us up. It is now up to us to maintain what he did for us in our lives. So once he did the work, the maintenance is our is our job. He did all he was going to do on the cross 2,000 plus years ago. He uh, did all the things. The veil was rent in two. The spirit came out. All the, He went into hell, got the keys, brought them back to us, gave them to us. Now the maintenance is up to us. What I do from this point forward is up to me. He did his part. Now we got to maintain what he already did. Faith without works is dead. That's also in the Bible, right? He did it. And because he did it and because I'm thankful that he did it. And I don't mean legalism. I'm not saying you got a list of rules to follow. I can't follow all them rules. I can do the best I can to love people just like I love God. I can do the best to represent the Lord because he is the head over my life. I can do my best to raise my children because children are a gift from God. I can do my best to manage my finances because um, he shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. All of that. So whatever he did for me. On that cross, I'm going to maintain here to the best of my human ability. And this is how good God is. When my human ability is not good enough, he comes in and helps me. He comes in and helps me maintain. When I'm overwhelmed, when life is just too much, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Folk trying to put more work on you. He says, come, 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 come now. Give it to me. Let me take this. Give it, give it. Reminds me of when the kids and I are trying to get groceries out of the car and my kids can get a lot of groceries out. But still, as that parent, I want to take on all of it for them. I want to take as many bags as I can and say, Mom, we got it. No, I got it. I'm, I'm straight. You go ahead. I got this. Just get the door. Because that's how he is with me. I'm, I'm trying to pick up all the weight and the heavy load. And he's like, nope, just give it to me. I got it. You just get the door. Just go ahead. I got it. Go, go ahead. Just a side note, there were some stains on the underside of the glass that I couldn't reach, right? Because it was a glass on top. So, of course, the bottom had glass and he'll touch it and hands and the dog might get under there and she licking, thinking that food is dropping through the table. You know, whatever the whatever the case is. But I couldn't reach him. I was doing my very best. Couldn't reach him. I called my son to get the stains for me while kneeling down to remove the stains from the underside. He had inadvertently. Now he under here getting the underside off. He puts his hand on the top of the, the, the table again. So now not only do I have the stains I couldn't get through the bits and pieces under the table. Now I got to go back and wipe off the top of the table again. <laughs> and he's leaving fingerprints. I immediately gave him a face. Bruh, really? And said some words that expressed my displeasure for the oversight of the work that I just put into it. Didn't you see me just do all this? Like, why are you going to put your hands up here? So really, like you're not paying attention. Like what is going on exactly? What is happening in your brain? Are you are you with me today? I ask you to clean under the table, not touch the top of the table. I'm just going off. And God immediately brought to my mind that those fingerprints could easily be removed again just like they had been the first time. Nothing we do. You can uh, be, you know, on a good track and not do something 30 years and all of a sudden you do it. And God is saying to you, that's okay. Just like we got you back on track the last time, we getting back on track this time too. Don't worry about it. It does not, it does not um, cancel out all the good we've done. It doesn't cancel out everything, all the progress you've made. It doesn't cancel out anything just because it, you got those fingerprints on there again. No worries. We got the right stuff to clean it up. You're going to be able to be of you soon. Don't worry. Because a lot of us say, hey, we don't. What use am I to God? What use am I to God? You're of every use. 
All you have to do is say, God, use me. And I promise you, he going to give you something to do. Something. It may not be what you think you want to do, but I promise you, if it's what he wants done, he's going to bless that work. And ultimately, you're going to line up with it. You can be like, you know what? This is what I should have been doing my whole life. When I sit here and I preach, this is what I should have been doing my whole life. But I never would have told you that I was qualified to do this. I still don't feel qualified to do this, but I do it because this is what I should have been doing. What else is there for me to do? Where should I be except right here in this place right now in these moments? Remember, I don't have a man. I ain't got no husband. I am exactly where I should be because when he come here, I would not be here with you. I love all y'all, but I would, I would be with him. So in these moments, when I have time to serve, serve, give God everything you got, do the best of your ability. It's your reasonable service. But he goes above and beyond. And so here I am. I want to go above and beyond too. Yeah. Whatever you want me to do, God, however you want me to do it. You just explain it to me. Give me the roadmap. Give me the supernatural strategy and let me get after it. And I'm never too dirty. I'm never too far gone. There is nobody too far gone that God won't go for him. Remember the prodigal son? He was eating out the pig, the pig pen, eating slop. Now, I've slopped hogs before. My grandparents had pigs. I know what it's like. I know what they eat. This dude was like, bruh, if I go back to my daddy's house and I ask him, can I look, I know what I did was wrong. Can I just be a slave in your house? He said, even the slaves eat better than this. Even the servants in my dad's house eat better than this. And some of us approach God like that. Okay, well, you know, God knows that I'm a wretch undone. He knows I'm a sinner. And um, so I'm going to go back to him and just beg. What are we begging for? There's no begging God. The father was sitting up on top of the roof waiting. He had people positioned in every area. He can't watch it all, but he was like, okay, listen, let me tell you something. You sit here and you watch and you sit here and you watch and I'm going to watch over here and somebody to the back. And that man, when he saw his son coming from a long way off, he didn't see him up close to know it was his son, but there was something about that walk. There was something about the way he held his head, especially when you know you're going back in the presence of a king. You better come correct. I don't care what you're wearing. Your rags might not be clean but you better come correct and know who you coming into the presence of when his dad saw him coming a far way off he ran down to meet his son what other king do you know is going to come off his throne to go meet you the king of kings will come to meet you wherever you are he said dad i know i did wrong he didn't want to hear none of that none of that he said bring the robe Bring the ring and kill the calf. He'd been preparing for his return. The son left and hadn't planned to come back. Got all his money. He was out. He was like, see you later, bro. I'm out. But the father knew. I know how this is going to end. It ain't going to end well. So I'm just going to prepare myself. I'm going to sit up here. I don't know how long he sat and waited. But however long he sat and waited, he still waited. And that's what God is doing for some of us. Remember, I told us some of us know who he is. We don't know him. You don't know his character because his character is looking for you. He's looking for you a long way off. He don't care where you've been, what you've been doing. He probably smell like the pigs. And it's not like dad can't recognize pig odor. He recognized this is not this is not palace aroma right here. You've been somewhere you shouldn't have been. That's OK. He didn't make no mention. Didn't make a mention. He said, bring the robe and bring the ring. He's been planning that boy's return since the day he left. And that is what he's doing for us. He's planning for us to come back to him, to be restored to him, to be all of the things that he has pre and planned and foreordained for us to do. The only problem we have is that we don't know what it is and we get frustrated. We don't want to be, you be like, Lord, is God ever going to use me? He sure will. Just come on home. Just come on home. Just come to your first mind, your right mind that tells you where I am right now is not where I should be. And everybody that is in my father's house, even down to the servants, are doing better than me. So let me get my happy tail up and go on back home. That's that's exactly what it is. And here's daddy. They ain't had binoculars back then. He was straining to see. Is that my boy? Is that my boy? No, no, no that's my, hand, my boy. Oh, okay. King, you got to go down and eat. I will not eat till my boy gets back. And what did they do when his son got back? They had a feast. 
a pure feast. He said, kill the calf. He didn't say, well, y'all can throw that leg of lamb on the roaster. He had a whole calf for the boy. Because we got to fatten you up. We got to get you back to how you were before you left here. You're not in the right state at this moment. But don't worry. We're going to clean you up. I got the royal washers. Remember coming to America where the little washers had to wash the little king, whatever his name was, prince, prince, whatever his name was. We got the royal washers. We're going to wash you up. And then we're going to put you on the right clothes. I know they're hanging off you a little bit because you're a little skin and bones. But that's all right. We got a whole cap for you. We got everything that you need is right here. You're going to be back to who you was before you ever left. Don't worry. Even better. Even better. Even better. And that's what God wants to do with us. Okay. Whew, I feel Jesus in my spirit. Will we make mistakes? Absolutely. Will stuff get on us? Yep. Will we spill? We will. But he is well able to cover us and clean us time after time after time after time. So my question that I always pose before we leave, and I'm early tonight, y'all. Praise the Lord. Do you know him? Do you know him as the dad that is sitting up waiting for you? Because a lot of us, you still disqualifying yourself. Well, I did this. 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 David watched somebody else's wife, brought her in, slept with her, did all kind of stuff. He was freaky enough to do. Husband came home. He tried to send the man home so he wouldn't know he had been with his wife. Man was like, if my king ain't going, I'm not going. Sent the man to the front lines, told the people to leave him there. Knew that Uriah was going to be off with your neck. They did all of that and God still called David a man after his own heart. Still. Still. When David was wrong, he went to the Lord. He said, created me a clean heart, oh God, and renewing me a right spirit. Psalm 51 7 says, purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Pray that prayer. God, purge me with hyssop. Now, purging is not pretty. Just imagine the worst viral bacterial um, uh, um, case of the, uh, the stomach flu you ever had. That's purging. We're getting rid of it all, sis, from both ends. Child, just go on, take your little trash can in there and just stay a minute because you're going to be here for a while. That's purging. But you pray that and I bet you God will do all the things. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Allow the Lord to clean you. Don't try to keep doing it yourself. The hardest thing on my body to wash is my back. Child, I can't reach it. I be doing my back. I'm like, Lord, do a little something. Get you one of them little back rubbers because I ain't got nobody back there to wash. I can't call the kid. Hey, can somebody wash my back? No, God will wash all of these. He gets all the parts, all the nooks and the crannies. He'll do it. You, you don't need to take it on on your own. Just let him do it. He got the good old scrub brush and all the things. Dip it in a little Holy Ghost Jesus blood and just wash. And you wonder, how is this supposed to make me clean? But look at yourself in the mirror. Look at yourself in the mirror after you are washed in the blood. And you will look like white as snow. That's what we should look like. If you still see residue, then let him do it again. Wash again. That's all I can tell you. All right. Don't worry. If there are any stickers, stickies, stains, or fingerprints on you, God is well able to cover you with the right things to clean you up every time. Check out Romans 10, 9, and 10. God loves you unclean so much that he makes you clean. I'm an example of what a clean glass top looks like. I mean a person. <laughs> Love you guys. Y'all join me tomorrow for day 59. We're going to talk about the floors. Day 59, the floors. Thank you so much for stopping by. Like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Bye now. Bye, y'all.